So in the last lecture, we gave a very kind of whirlwind tour of how Bitcoin worked. Uh, I tried to touch on all of the different aspects. And in truth, it's a lot to absorb, uh, especially in one sitting. Uh, there's a lot of different moving parts. And even with all the crypto background that we had laid out, uh, it's probably still not clear how the whole thing comes together. Um, so that initial look was meant to be just that, a, a kind of first look at how Bitcoin works. Uh, and hopefully it, it sort of highlights all the different uh, other areas that are involved in it, okay? Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to go back through the Bitcoin protocol, okay? So we're going to go over and over and over it uh, a couple times until it, it hopefully becomes um, a little bit clearer. And in particular, what we're going to do is we're going to look at it from a couple different angles. There's there's about five angles that I, that I think are, are sort of interesting to look at. So um, in this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the data structures that are involved. Uh, so what is a transaction? What exactly does it look like? Uh, when you take all your transactions and you put in a block, what is what does that look like? Uh, so what are the data structures that are involved? Okay. Then we're going to think about what does the network look like? So you somehow this transaction, you know, we know what its data structure is, but how does that transaction go from my computer um, all the way to uh, being actually included in a block? Uh, what, what does that sort of look like? So uh, we'll talk about the network. Uh, then we'll talk about consensus. So there was this idea that uh, some of these nodes are miners and they're doing these proofs of work and um, there's a lot of different components, you know, they're, they're trying to validate transactions and how do we know that they're all going to do what the, that the protocol tells them to do, uh, what are the incentives that are involved, that type of thing. And so uh, consensus is a big chunk as well. Then uh, when we talk about the network, we're, we're basically going to start with a transaction leaves a computer, but how did that transaction leave the computer. I mean, it's not that the computer obviously didn't decide to send that money of its own volition. A user told it to do that. So what's the user experience like? What is it like? Do you use software to, to use Bitcoin? What does that software look like? Uh, how do you use it? Um, you know, what kind of information do you need to, to, to use? How do you get Bitcoin in the first place? So I have a $20 bill and it's sitting in my wallet. How do I turn that into Bitcoin? Okay, so what's this whole sort of user experience? Um, uh, behind it. Uh, and then finally, there's also a bunch of economics that are involved. So we mentioned that, you know, there's 21 million Bitcoin that are created. Uh, they're sort of divisible. Um, there's this idea of fees that you're included. So what, who sets the fees? How expensive are they? Um, you know, what, what are all the different sort of parameters that go into kind of the, the finance side or the economic side of, of how Bitcoin operates? Okay, so uh, we'll look at all of these sort of in isolation uh, and we'll do kind of a deeper dive on each of these five topics. Uh, then when we're done all of that, we'll still have even more. There's a, a bunch of kind of miscellaneous issues that um, are kind of interesting for, for a variety of reasons. And so we'll go through a, a kind of list of, of things like different problems that have happened in Bitcoin. So like transaction malleability. Uh, we'll talk about some of the stuff you can build on top of Bitcoin, like Lightning Networks. We'll talk um, here, we're, we're not even going to do the deepest dive in terms of the data, data structure in this lecture, but we'll talk about scripting uh, and, and how that's used and a, a few other things, okay? Um, okay, so with that said, uh, let's dive into the transaction data structure. So one thing about Bitcoin is because it's uh, based on this idea of a blockchain and the blockchain records every transaction, what that actually means is that every transaction ever, you know, going back uh, to the start of Bitcoin, back to the very first transaction, um, is recorded. And so you can see it. And there's different ways of seeing it. One is that you download this data structure and, and you look at it on your computer. Um, the other thing that, that lots of different uh, companies have done uh, or, or different projects have done is they built nice web interfaces where you can see the blockchain, uh, you can see um, all the blocks have been added and if you click on a block you see all the transactions that are in a block if you set it if you click on a transaction you see all the details of that transaction itself so uh, there's there's different tools that use them uh, one of them if you looked at a particular transaction this is sort of what you would see um, so let's go through this and we'll uh, kind of piece out parse out um, uh, 
all the different things that are, are sort of interesting to us. And uh, this actually includes a lot, a lot of data, uh, and I'm not going to touch on everything, uh, but I'll, I'll give you kind of the highlights, okay? So this is a transaction, uh, you can see it, and uh, the transaction will have an ID or an identifier. Uh, so if we want to refer to it uh, later, uh, then we'll, we'll have an ID. Uh, the ID happens to be a hash of the contents of the transaction. So it's not an arbitrary ID that, that's applied, it's actually a hash. How you do that is, um, is, is sort of relevant uh, to our discussions. Um, we'll talk about this thing called transaction malleability. Uh, we'll talk about another thing called segmented witness. Uh, and how those two will have an impact on, on how the exact structure that this ID takes. Uh, but for now, let's just think of it as a hash of the transaction. That's, that's a sufficient mental model for, for understanding this, okay? Um, and we know that if you hash, uh, once you get the hash of something, it, you're not gonna find something else that hashes to the same value. That's collision resistance of the hash function. So um, every transaction will have a unique ID. So this you this ID specifies this transaction. If you change any of these details, then this hash is going to change as well. Um, so this is a unique identifier for this particular transaction. Okay, um, the, the main meat of the transaction is you have a set of, of input values. Uh, this is Bitcoin that somebody has owned, uh, and you have a set of output values, okay? So in this particular transaction, this is a recent transaction, I pulled it off of the latest block. Um, or the second latest block. And um, uh, what you can see is that uh, we have four uh, inputs, okay? Uh, and for every input, what we have are three things. There's three elements to, to each input. And so uh, this isn't shown as, as well as maybe as it could be, but these are the three elements. So the first is, uh, this is the address that, or the, um, the public key, the hash of the public key. So we call the hash of a public key an address. And uh, later when we talk about um, uh, the user experience, maybe we'll, we'll circle back onto that, or, or maybe I can, I can run through it after. Actually, you know what, let's, let's just sort of do this now. So I'm innovating on the fly here, but um, we'll talk about um, this concept of an address. So if you wanna receive Bitcoin, uh, eventually you're gonna sign for it. And if you sign for it, uh, you're going to use your signing key. And so that signing key has a public key that's associated with it. And so the way that we originally pitched Bitcoin is that you would send money from one public key, uh, verification key for a digital signature scheme, one public key to another public key. And it turns out that you, you, can, you can certainly do that um, within Bitcoin, uh, but it's not very common. Uh, the reason it's not common is because public keys end up being too long. There, there are too many characters and if you look at these things, these are what addresses end up looking like. And that's obviously not something that you're going to memorize. You're not going to memorize what, what someone's address looks like. Um, but these are at least, you know, reasonably compact that if, if you send it across a text message or something like that, like you could actually maybe type one of these things in and, you know, if you put in a QR code or something like that, it's not going to be a, a very big um, QR code. Okay. Um, so the idea of a Bitcoin address is it's going to be your public key, but we're going to take it and we're going to make it in a, a little more succinct uh, of a format or a little more concise. Okay. Uh, so specifically what we're going to do is we're going to use a hash function. So we're going to take your actual public key. Uh, so I'll call it a public signing key. Uh, and this is for ECDSA. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to hash it down. And just in case maybe there is a human that types this in, the chances of you making a mistake is actually quite high. And so what we're going to do is we're going to add a little uh, error correction on the end or like kind of like a checksum. Um, so I'll put error correction code. Uh, it's, it's more like a checksum in the sense that if, if you get it wrong, it, there, the chances are that it would then be an invalid address. So if you, if you mistype this address in with high probability, it would end up being an invalid address, then your client can tell you that. Uh, and so you have a chance to sort of rectify this. Okay. Um, uh, so, so that's what this is doing. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to spit it out. Uh, 
And uh, the thing that comes at the other end is, is called an address or a Bitcoin address. And typically not essential, but normally we uh, denote it in something that we call base 58. Uh, so what this means is that uh, you have, um, each symbol can be a number, it can be a letter, uh, and the letters could be capital or the letters could be, um, could be lowercase, okay? And so that gives you actually 64 characters, okay? Uh, that's, that's the number of, of, of characters that you would have uh, if you did it that way. Um, but what ends up happening is some of the, the characters look the same, right? So the difference between a one and a small L and a capital I is very, very negligible. And so to also try and cut down on sort of errors if people happen to be typing these things in, uh, there is this notion of what's called base 58, uh, where we drop a bunch of characters that kind of look like other characters that look too close uh, to other characters. And so you end up with a subset of the alphabet uh, that, that has 58 remaining characters and which exactly these are, it doesn't really matter. You can look it up, but um, so our address is going to be in, in this sort of base 58 uh, format. Okay. Uh, and it will be fairly succinct. Uh, so it would like fit in a QR code, that kind of thing. Okay, uh, the final thing I'll say about this is what's the hash function that's used? Um, so the hash function um, that's used is, uh, it actually goes through two hash functions, uh, but the hash function that's used last uh, is called ripeMD160. And so I mentioned this way back when we talked about all the different hash functions. And I said, there's this RiveMD160 thing. It's the only time it's ever used is in this one particular case and it's used in this specific case, okay? Uh, and the reason uh, that it's used here as opposed to just using SHA-256 is that the output of this is 160 bits, okay? Uh, and so that's what's making this kind of a short hash function. Could you use SHA-256, take your 256 bits, truncate it down to 160 bits? You absolutely could. Uh, the consequence would be basically the same. Uh, it wouldn't be any more or less secure uh, than using RIPEMD-160. Why RIPEMD-160 is used, no one really knows. It was just a, a sort of arbitrary choice that was uh, made by the, uh, or the author of Bitcoin. Um, so this has 160-bit output. Okay, now if you've you know had 10 cups of coffee and you're really on the ball and really sharp, you might point out, hey, wait a minute, I thought hash functions had to be at least 224 bits or, or more like 256 bits to be secure uh, against collision attacks, to be collision resistance. And you're absolutely right. So RIPEMD-160 only has 80 bits of half of 160, 80 bits of collision resistance, which means it's not collision resistant, okay? Um, but at the same time, it's not really clear that if you could generate collisions, um, that it would become particularly problematic, okay? What you don't want is, let's say I hash my public key and you can take your public key and you can find, um, uh, you can choose any public key you want. So you happen to choose one where the hash of your public key matches the hash of mine. That would be a big problem because then when people send money to my hash of my public key, you could say, well, actually they were sending it to the hash of this public key, which is your public key, okay? Um, so that sounds like a collision attack. It is a kind of collision attack, but that's a weak collision, okay? That's a target collision. That's where you were given the hash and you found something else that hashed to the same value, okay? Uh, in order to do that attack, uh, this, this hash function resists that attack, okay? It's big enough to resist uh, that particular attack, okay? It's more than 112 bits, it's 160 bits. Uh, in a collision attack, uh, collision resistant attack, uh, the setup of the attack, what it would make sense in, in the situation of, of generating addresses is you generate two addresses, two different public keys, you know both of them, presumably you know the signing keys that correspond to those two public keys. Um, so you, you generate those two public keys such that they happen to hash to the same value. Um, so that's kind of like you have two keys that unlock the same lock, right? But you, know, you, you 
chose both of those two keys and you chose the value of the lock. And so the fact that you know two keys that unlock it instead of one key that unlocks it doesn't seem that meaningful. Uh, it doesn't seem like anything would go wrong, right? If two different people have keys that open the same lock, that's a problem, okay? But if one person has two keys that open the same lock, not, not a problem or not thought to be a problem. So anyway, there have been some sort of spirited debates about whether this is problematic. And some people argue that maybe when you have like these really complicated contracts that maybe there's some problem with this. But anyway, no one's actually demonstrated a, a, like a simple use case where uh, if you could break the collision resistance of, of RipeMD, that it would be problematic. And I note if you could, because theoretically you can, it, it's two to the 80 work, but that's still, that's a lot of work. You know, that's a lot of work for a computer to do. And so it's it's actually kind of, it, there's no security margin, uh, but it's it's still, it's not something that you can just do on your laptop arbitrarily. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's still a really, really hard attack. And then additionally, uh, it doesn't seem to have any benefit. Uh, if you can do it. Okay. Okay. So that's an address. Now let's go all the way back up. So we're, we started, we brought up this discussion of an address because we were looking at transaction. Transaction has an ID, has a set of inputs. It has a set of outputs. Uh, so two outputs in this case. And each input has four things. So it has the address that is owning uh, this. And we'll, we'll talk about how an address gets affiliated because that the answer to that is actually on the output side. But anyways, uh, th this address here, uh, so this value right here is an address. And what we're saying is that this address has control of at least this amount of Bitcoin. Okay, so we have an amount. BTC is uh, an abbreviation for Bitcoin. Uh, so that's in currency form. If you're talking about Bitcoin, the currency, as opposed to Bitcoin, the, the system, uh, we use BTC. And then what you're going to do is you have to prove that this address actually owns this amount, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to point to the transaction where you received that uh, amount. So somewhere in the past, somebody moved some amount of Bitcoin to this address. Uh, and we'll talk about whether it needs to be at least this much or exactly this much. Uh, that, that's something that's a, a, a little detail that we need to, to wrap up. But for now, just in the past, this amount of Bitcoin had get, gotten moved to this address. And so what you're going to do is you're going to point at it. So you're going to point at some past transaction. And in this particular user interface for the, the uh, blockchain data, uh, because this is a web presentation, they're, they're sort of parsing out the data and displaying it. They have it as a hyperlink. So if you go and you uh, click on that particular output, uh, then it will take you to the previous transaction. Um, in the blockchain data structure itself, you would have that transaction written down. So you'd have the ID of some transaction that happened in the past. Uh, you would also have uh, which of the, if, if that transaction had, it might have more than one output. And so you'd also specify which output uh, it has, okay? Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about the accounting uh, in a bit, but let's let's just do kind of initial pass and then we'll soak her, soak her back to some of these smaller details, okay? So uh, we have a set of four inputs to this transaction. Each of them consists of the address that controls the input, the amount, uh, and it also consists of the a link to the transaction where this amount was received, okay? Now, what people want to do, uh, what miners want to do when they look at this transaction is they want to go back to this past transaction and ask themselves, was this amount of Bitcoin actually moved into this address in this transaction? And then the other thing they want to do is they want to figure out whether this has already been spent. Uh, so this amount of money was moved to this, let's say it was moved to this address. Well, there might be another transaction that already spent it. Okay, so keeping track of what previous uh, amounts of money that you've received, which we'll, we'll start calling outputs, uh, have been spent or not. Uh, that's something that we'll pick up when we do the network layer pass. So we'll, we'll talk about at a network level how these transactions move around and how you kind of figure out what's been spent and what hasn't been spent, okay? Uh, but for now, we'll assume that for some reason the, the computer that's looking at this has a way of knowing whether this has been spent or not. And we'll assume that it's unspent although this transaction will spend it, okay? Uh, so we have an address amount uh, linked to a past transaction. 
And then we have our outputs themselves, okay? Um, so this is the new address that's going to control uh, some amount. And this is going to be an amount that we should move into that address, okay? And if we add up these outputs and we add up this set of inputs, it has to be the case that the sum of the inputs is greater or equal to the sum of the outputs. Okay, so we want to make sure that we're not moving more money into these two output accounts than the total amount of money that came into this transaction. Uh, the next thing is how many output addresses? So here we have two, why, why two? So that's completely arbitrary. So the person who's spending this money, they can decide how they want to split it. So when you pull a bunch of inputs into a transaction, you can specify one address, two address, three, four, five, it doesn't matter. You can specify any number of addresses. You can have any split of the money here. The only condition is just that when, you, when I add up all these outputs, I'm not outputting more than I input. Okay, I can output less than I input. Okay, so here you'll notice that if you add these four numbers up, you get this value. And if you add up these two numbers, you get a value that's slightly smaller. Okay, and so what that means is the difference uh, will be a fee. Uh, and this will be given to the miner who includes this transaction in a block. Um, okay, and when we circle back to either consensus or the network labor, we'll pick up why this is the mechanism. Like, why don't you just write the miner's address? Like, you have it, you know, this amount of money is going to this amount, this amount of money is going to this person, or sorry, this amount's going to this person. Why don't you just take the difference, the fee? put it as a new output and then put the miner's address here. That, that seems a lot easier. But the answer is you don't know which miner is going to include your transaction. Okay, so when you sign off on this transaction and, and distribute it to the network, you don't know which of the miners it's, it's going to be that takes that. Okay, and so that's why this mechanism is used where it's sort of money that's left over. Okay, and so the miner that actually takes your transaction and puts it in a block, what they're going to do is they're going to claim that fee. They're going to say, uh, what they'll do is they'll actually claim all the fees uh, for their transaction. So they'll, they'll add a transaction to the block that pays themselves a certain amount of Bitcoin. And everyone has to check that that amount of Bitcoin that they're paying themselves is actually the sum of the fees plus the, uh, the reward for solving that block, the new currency that's, that's minted uh, when that block is created. Um, so anyway, so, so that's another finesse that... that uh, the, the problem with Bitcoin is, is each of these little things has like a whole bigger story behind it. And eventually you'll, we'll go through this enough that, that you'll start to see how all these pieces come together. But um, I want to I wanna try and keep ourselves uh, kind of on focus here and, and not go on too many tangents, uh, explaining every little detail. OK, um, so anyways, we have a fee here. OK, then they give you some statistics. So this is just the website. Um, and they're just kind of telling you a bit about um, how, how it works. And uh, another thing I'll, I'll mention, I'll circle back when we talk about the economics, but uh, generally the amount of fees that you pay, it's optional. So you, don't, you can pay zero if you want, or you can, you can spend a lot. And usually what miners are looking for is they don't actually care how much Bitcoin is being transacted. This could be a little bit or a lot. This could be a billion dollars or it could be one dollar or it could be 10 cents. They don't really care about the amount in terms of the fee. So the fee is not a percentage of the amount of Bitcoin. What they actually care about is the size of the transaction, right? Like how many input addresses are there? How many output addresses? Because for all the addresses, they have to do the work of, of doing these checks and going back and seeing past transactions and things like that. And so they're, they're much more concerned about the size of this transaction. So if you have a transaction that moves a billion dollars from one address to one address, that's going to be a very cheap transaction. If you want to move one cent from, let's say you have tenths of or hundreds of cents across a hundred addresses, and so you have a hundred addresses that are coming into this thing, uh, and then you're you're sort of, you know, maybe sending half of the cent to one person, half to another person. Um, in that case, you're going to pay a lot, 
uh, for that because the size of it is going to be huge. So uh, the fees are actually proportional to the size of, of the method, not or of the um, transaction, not the actual amount. Okay. Um, so anyway, so so we have uh, the size of it uh, is listed here. Okay. Weight we'll skip over. Not important. Uh, there's a time that it was received. This is an assertion. So because there's a, a network of computers, all of them have slightly different clocks. And so no one can say that this was received at exactly this time down to the second. But someone's suggesting that this is this is a pretty accurate time. And then there's going to be a lot of uh, fuzziness in terms of when it was actually received. There'll, there'll be a certain window of time. And, and so miners will kind of check to see that this transaction seemed to come roughly at this time. Um, Lock time will skip as well. Um, okay, the next thing is that this transaction has actually been included in a block. Okay, so some miner solved the block and included it uh, in it. So this is not a transaction that's floating around the network waiting to be put in a block. This is actually in a block. Uh, the block is this one here. Uh, so 545,489th block. Uh, it gives you a timestamp, once again, an assertion of uh, when this block was created. Um, since in the time uh, that this block was created and the time that I went to this website and I took this screenshot, uh, two more blocks have been added onto the end of it. So this isn't the last block in the blockchain anymore. There's two new ones. And if we go and visit that website now, I think I've, I've talked long enough that uh, you can see that the number of confirmations have gone up. Okay. So anyways, this is sort of the transactions, okay? Now, the next thing I wanna, I wanna make sure that uh, we make really clear, it's something that, that on the first pass through I, I mentioned, um, but it's, uh, it's something that, that you have to think about a few times, um, is uh, how we think about the accounting within Bitcoin. Okay, it's totally possible. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't work this way. Uh, half by happenstance, half for, there, there are sort of efficiency arguments you can make, but at a functional level, there's no reason why every address could have a balance. So if you go to this address, you'll see, oh, it has some particular balance. And here what you're saying is, my balance is at least big enough to cover this amount, okay? And when this transaction goes through, what happens is we sort of go into this balance and we decrease it by this amount, uh, we go into the balance of this particular address and we increase it by this particular amount. Okay, so everyone ends up with sort of a new balance. And there are blockchains that work uh, that way. Um, but anyways, this, that's not how Bitcoin chose to do it. Uh, what Bitcoin does is it says, what you have is you have a set of outputs. So let's say that this is like the last transaction that happened. Uh, so no transaction has happened since uh, this particular transaction, okay? Um, what will happen is, uh, what, what you'll see is you'll see that there's two addresses here that have a particular output. So this address now is holding this amount of money, okay? And if this amount of, if this particular address wants to spend this amount of money, what they're going to do is they're going to create a new transaction and the input to that new transaction will include a pointer to this transaction. They'll say, hey, in this transaction, I received this amount of money. And the rule is in the new transaction, they have to spend this amount, okay? They can't take half of it or some fraction of it, okay? Uh, if they're gonna include this as an input to a new transaction, they have to include this full amount, okay? So, uh, uh, each input to a transaction, and there is a corner case with the, these uh, what are called coin-based transactions, which are a special transaction that doesn't have an input. But for a standard transaction, there's an input. Um, each input uh, to a transaction spends a previous output of a transaction 
uh, fully. Okay. Um, great. Okay. And what you can see is that even uh, either within the same block, so you can actually receive money and then turn around and spend it within the same block. So either within the same block or in the next block, there are have been already transactions, even though this is a really new transaction and there's only two blocks on the end of it. These, these, this money has actually already been spent. So it moved into these accounts and then it moved somewhere else. Um, so this is what we call a, a spent output, okay? Um, so just to introduce some sort of jargon, um, you can think of Bitcoin as actually being kind of like Coinbase. These are kind of like coins that you have. So you, you have a coin of this amount and you have a coin of this amount, and you have a coin of this amount, and you have a coin of this amount. And when you decided that, hey, I want to send um, uh, this amount, 0.2 Bitcoin, what you said is, well, I don't have a coin that's big enough to send this amount. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a bunch of coins that I have that are smaller, and I'm going to add them all together. Then I'll send this amount. And then what, what often happens is when you put all these coins together, they end up being more than you want to spend. So what I'm going to assume is that uh, we, we don't know for sure that this is the case, but, but it seems pretty obvious to me that uh, the person who sent this Bitcoin, uh, the, what they sat down at their computer and, and told their computer to do was, hey, I want to send 0.2446 to this address. OK, what their computer said is, OK, I have all these keys that I control, uh, these different addresses, and I have these different outputs that I've received. And for whatever reason, I'm going to put a bunch of them together. So these are the ones that I chose. And when I add these up, they add up to an amount that's bigger than this. OK, so I can I can complete this transaction. The question is, what do I do with the difference? Right. So this adds up to a certain amount. I only want to send this amount. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send the rest of it back to myself as change, as it's called. OK. Uh, so what I do is I take a bunch of addresses that I own, I add them all together, uh, then I send the amount to the person that I want to, and then the leftover I send back to myself as change, and then if there's a leftover to the leftover, it's given to the miner as a fee. Now this change address, you'll notice it's different than, uh, first off, why, why do I have four addresses? Like, why wouldn't I just have one address? Um, and so the answer is, we'll talk about this during the user experience part. Uh, but your wallet tends to generate a whole bunch of addresses and kind of moves between them for anonymity reasons. Um, and then it, uh, when it creates a change address, it tends to make, create a new change address as well for, for once again, for anonymity reasons. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later, okay? But probably what's happening in this transaction is this amount of money, just because it's a cleaner number, it doesn't have as many decimal points. And also it's a bigger number. Um, uh, this is probably the main payment and then this would be the change. It's a smaller number and it's kind of a messy number uh, in terms of number of decimal places. Uh, so it's most likely the change that's going back uh, to the original person. Okay. Um, so accounting with Bitcoin. So each input to a transaction spends uh, an existing output of a transaction. It spends it fully. Uh, and the output, the output of the transaction has to also it also has to be the first time you're spending it you're not allowed to spend transactions more than once okay so it spends a previous unspent output of a transaction okay and just to introduce some jargon uh, we tend to call this thing this unspent transaction output uh, we call it exactly that so it's a bit of a mouthful uh, but we often abbreviate it uh, to UTXO, uh, so unspent transaction. TX is sometimes a short form for transaction, and then O is output. Okay, so UTXO, unspent transaction output. So what you hold is uh, you hold a bunch of coins and coins are technically these unspent transaction outputs. So you have a bunch of them, uh, they have different amounts. And even if these addresses were the same, they're uh, transaction outputs, unspent transaction outputs, UTXOs that you received at different times. Uh, so there were different transactions, even though they, they moved some amount to the same address, 
uh, these backward pointers to previous transactions would be to different transactions. Okay, so you might see uh, the same four addresses here with a bunch of amounts, but each of these links to past transactions would be different. Uh, so there are different times where you received these amounts to that same address. Uh, and then you might send your change back to that address as well. So some wallets work that way, some of them don't. And we'll, we'll talk about that uh, another time. Okay, so we have these UTXOs, okay? Now the final thing that's in the transaction um, is, is something I didn't show, uh, so it's, it's sort of buried here. Um, But there's this whole notion of what we call a script. And a script is going to specify um, how you're able to spend one of these UTXOs. Okay, so this, this is now, uh, at least when this transaction was first put into the blockchain, this was a UTXO, an unspent transaction output. It's now a spent transaction output because someone has, has spent it since. But every transaction output, the standard way to spend it is you sign a transaction that tries to spend it. You basically make a new transaction. You say, I want to spend this, and then I'm going to sign it with the key that's associated with this address, okay? And the way that you instruct Bitcoin that that's what you want to do is you actually write it in terms of this little script. So you write this little computer script that basically says, um, take the public key of the person trying to spend this, you know, hash it down, and turn it into a Bitcoin address and then make sure that it matches this Bitcoin address, then go ahead and spend it, okay? But you actually write this, or your, your software does it without you being aware of it, it actually writes out this full script, okay? And so scripts are kind of complicated and they have their whole language and uh, it's something that, that I don't want to get bogged down with yet. It's important, we're going to talk about it, uh, but we're, we're just going to punt on this uh, for a second, okay? So scripts will specify how uh, UTXOs are spent, what's the mechanism uh, for it. And uh, most transactions follow what, what's called a standard transaction. So there's a standard script. Uh, and that script in scripting language basically says um, uh, UTXO can be spent, what does it mean to be spent? Well, to be an input, okay? It can be spent or AKA be an input. To a transaction, uh, can be spent in a transaction. If and only if uh, the transaction is signed by the key, uh, you know, uh, related to the Bitcoin address or the key inside the Bitcoin address. of the UTXO, okay? So the UTXO is a, a transfer, it's an output to a Bitcoin address. The key, uh, the signing key of that Bitcoin address actually signs off on the transaction that's trying to spend the UTXO. Okay, so that's that's what a, a transaction looks like. Um, and uh, let's, let's break here and then we'll we'll circle back and, and we'll think about what the data structure of a, a block uh, looks like. <laughs>